presentation for the group. So now start the recording. I'll be serious now. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I was saying that uh, along with the lung ultrasound, I'm interested to study the diaphragm. Has lots of contribution, the same as you heard about lung ultrasound and how it can inform our uh, clinical decision. The same for the diaphragm too. Uh, it helps you, especially if you have a baby on mechanical ventilation or a baby post surgery, and you need to know how efficient the diaphragm is working. Um, as you know, there is multiple ways of assisting the diaphragm, so not only ultrasound, but for this session, we'll focus on using the bedside ultrasound to assess the diaphragmatic function. So I have nothing to disclose. Uh, my objective today is to discuss with you the first I will start with some anatomy and function for the diaphragm. Then we'll go over the technique, how we can perform a diaphragm ultrasound and what are the indices, what you will be using to report your diaphragm function. Um, and then we'll conclude with some literature review to see what's the evidence outside of using or utilizing the um, ultrasound to assess the diaphragm, uh, not only in uh, neonates, but I might share some uh, other uh, literature too, because as you know, uh, for lung ultrasound and diaphragm, adults actually are the leading uh, group, and we are learning a lot from, uh, from them. So I always suggest that you, when you do your search, don't limit your search for neonatal, but add also pediatric and, uh, and adult. They have lots of uh, stuff to add to our knowledge. So as you know, the diaphragm is the principal muscle for respiration. It, you can count on the diaphragm around 80% of the inspiratory effort. And uh, this function of the diaphragm was found to have uh, contributed to difficult weaning of ventilation or actually prolong the duration of ventilation if the diaphragm is not uh, functioning very well. The sonographic evaluation of diaphragm is not an old topic, so it's a recent one, and it's gaining more and more uh, popularity in the NICU as a non-invasive technique to assess the uh, readiness of the, uh, our babies to, uh, for extubation. The structure of the diaphragm, and I'm talking very, very brief because this is just introduction to our uh, ultrasound uh, assessment of the diaphragm. The diaphragm is formed of four parts. So the middle central part is called the transverse septum. And you have the two on both sides, the right and left pluriproteinian folds. Then you have in the center, the what we call the esophageal mesentery, where it has the holes for the esophagus, for the descending aorta and other structure. And more important, I will say the periphery part of the diaphragm that's attached to the chest wall, um, uh, that we call it the muscular body of the, of the diaphragm. So this is the four parts of the diaphragm. I need you to focus on this part because we will talk a lot about this part of the diaphragm. Uh, the, area of opposition, which is the, the muscular part of the diaphragm that start to be attached to the chest wall. And this is important for our assessment of the diaphragmatic function. Alongside with the diaphragm dome or copula of the diaphragm. So this is the two parts that we're going to talk about and discuss how we can assess the function of this part, the dome of the diaphragm, and the muscular part or the area of opposition that's attached to the uh, chest wall. So regarding the function of the diaphragm, I like to summarize it as this is the piston. It works like a piston that with the movement uh, up and down, it helps with decrease the, uh, or increase actually the negativity uh, or negative pressure inside the thorax that help with the inhalation and increase the lung volume. And when the diaphragm goes back, it increases the pressure inside the chest and lead to exhalation uh, of the air outside the, the chest. It's work, uh, the simple way is to consider it like a piston.
I'm able to fix this one just for a second. Yeah. So what's the indices for assessing the diaphragm using the ultrasound? I, this slide's a little bit busy, uh, but it, it's, it, it represents almost like 80% of the whole presentation in one. So you have this holistic picture, then we'll go piece by piece and explain each part. So we can assess the function of the diaphragm in two ways, what we call the quant uh, qualitative way. So this should be the quantitative, it's like a typo issue. So there is the quantitative uh, a way of assessing the diaphragm, which is divided into two parts assessing the thickness of the diaphragm. And here I'm talking about the diaphragm thickness during inspiration, diaphragm thickness during expiration. Then with the assistant of a formula, we'll, uh, we'll calculate the diaphragmatic thickness fraction. And the other piece that is still quantitative is the diaphragmatic expulsion, which is the up and down movement uh, of the diaphragm. This would be the second part. Each one has its uh, own way of assessing. As you can look at the picture, when we assess the thickness of the diaphragm, we'll go all the way to the lateral view of the chest. Versus when you do the excursion, because you are aiming to the dome of the diaphragm, you need to be in the subcostal. And different probes too. In the thickness, you need to use the linear probe versus in the excursion, you have to change the probe what we call the curvilinear probe. The second way is not quantitative, it will be qualitative um, assessment of the diaphragm, which by eye pooling, looking at the movement of the diaphragm just by your eyes without doing any measurement for the, uh, the diaphragm. This is the first part, the qualitative assessment of the diaphragm by eye pooling. And if we run this video, you can, by only looking at, so as you know, uh, from the previous presentations, this is the liver, this is the diaphragm, this echogenic uh, part that separates the abdominal content, liver, and here the kidney from the, uh, the lung itself. And you can see some B lines, uh, you can see them here. Uh, looking at the diaphragm, you can say, yeah, there is good, contraction or um, excursion of the diaphragm, this up and down movement of the diaphragm without even doing any measurement. Similar here, and I need you to focus between these two lines. This is how the diaphragm looks like uh, in the area of opposition. So I'm using the lever as our acoustic window. And this is the, the upper white line is called the uh, brighter or the plural uh, border of the diaphragm. And the one below is the proteinial uh, layer of the diaphragm. And this black in between the hypochoic area is the muscle itself, the diaphragm itself. And if you look at these two lines, as the baby is breathing, you see these two lines are narrowing during expiration and getting thicker during inspiration. And this movement keep repeating itself. If you look at these two lines, see them narrowing, widening, narrowing, widening all the time. And if you do the M mode, you can see them in this widening, then narrowing, widening, then narrowing as you see in this uh, M mode. So this is what we call the eye pooling without doing any measurements uh, for the, the diaphragm. The other way that you, um, if you are going to do this one for academic, like to publication, you have to do the quantitative uh, assessment of the diaphragm. And as I mentioned earlier, you need to report the excursion and you need to report the thickness of the diaphragm. To do the excursion, again, you need to use the curvilinear probe. And I'm going to explain it more in the subsequent slides, but this is again, another slide where I bring all together so you can uh, understand both methods at the same time and we'll talk about the details in the subsequent slide. So you position your probe in the subcostal, the curvilinear, 
looking upward toward the diaphragm because now what's underneath you below the skin subcutaneous tissue is actually the liver and you are using the liver as a positive window for the waves to travel through the liver and reach to the diaphragm where you can see the movement and assess the movement of the diaphragm. And this is where the probe is. So this area represented here uh, where the skin starts and this is the liver and this is the diaphragm that you are going to assess. And if there is normal diaphragmatic movement, there is no paralysis, there is no eventuation. What you expect is the diaphragm during inspiration will start to move toward the probe. When it moves toward the probe, similar to echo and other um, doublers, it gives you a positive deflection. So it goes up above the baseline. And this is how you see the, the excursion of the diaphragm. And depend on the rate of breathing, you will see like multiple um, inspiration, expiration cycle, then both then inspiration, expiration, and goes all the way. Okay. So this is the diaphragmatic excursion. For the diaphragmatic um, uh, thickness, we you change the probe to the uh, linear probe. And because, as I mentioned earlier, you need to measure the thickness at the area of opposition. And remember, this is just below the thoracic wall. So you need a high frequency probe. Uh, so it will give you a good resolution of the superficial part of the, uh, the lung, which will be the, the diaphragm. And in here, um, you, are, you will be seeing more or less the same, but you will see skin, subcutaneous tissue. Then the diaphragm will come as the two layer, that as I indicated earlier, the um, peritoneal and the uh, pleural layers, and the muscle will be in between. And again, as I will show you in the subsequent slide, if this is the dynamic, a video, you will see narrowing, widening, narrowing, widening. And the narrowing represents the expiration and the widening um, that represents the inspiration. And you, you will be able to measure this to a, a points, which is the narrowing part, represent the thickness during expiration. And you can measure the BB uh, the two points here that represent the thickness during inspiration. Um, the, the, the diaphragm is as any muscle of the body. When it contracts, it becomes thicker. And when it relaxes, it becomes thinner. And we need to remember this fact. So let's talk about the thickness and come very close to how we do this one by ultrasound. So first, what bro? you need to use, you have to use the linear probe. If you are assessing the thickness, uh, then the probe has to be the linear, and linear can be the flat one or the hockey stick one. Any linear probe uh, will be appropriate to assess the diaphragm. And where to position your probe? To be precise, you need to position the probe between the anterior axillary line and the mid-axillary line. And the area will be somewhere between the seventh rib and the ninth rib. And as a, a principle, similar to any type of point of care, if you are doing echo, if you are doing uh, abdominal ultrasound, if you are doing vascular, if you are doing head ultrasound, when we say you need to be in this area, like the anterior, uh, anterior axillary and mid axillary, and between the seventh rib and ninth rib, this is your initial position of the probe but you might need to move it a little bit toward the anterior axillary, or you need to move it down toward the middle axillary, or a little bit up, or a little bit down until you get the perfect picture. So there is no magic uh, dot that I will say, if you put it on at this position, at the eighth step, it will give you the image immediately. No, you need to manipulate your, your probe, moving a little bit up or down, and uh, from side to side, anterior axillary versus the mid axillary, but roughly this is the area that you will find the best area to look at the, uh, the diaphragm and measure the thickness. And to narrow this one, this is the whole chest one, and we are looking actually to this circuit. You see this area down here in this cartoon? This is where you need to measure the thickness of the diaphragm in this area, 
and to focus more, your uh, linear probe will be on the skin on this area here, and you will be looking at this um, uh, thickness of the diaphragm. No lung should come in your view. What you will be target will be little part, little part of the, the lung and the liver and the first part of the diaphragm above the liver adjacent to the, the lung. This is called, called the area of opposition. I'll show you some image for this one. So here, what I'm referring to. So you are using, this is the end or the base of the lung when you are doing a R2 or L2 on the other side or R3 or L3 because you are more lateral. And uh, it will be, it will show you the end of the lung in here. You can see the pleural line. You can see the rib, shadow of the rib. Then the liver comes in here. If you are in this area, the area of opposition, the next part will be the diaphragm that you will see on top of the liver on the right side or the spleen on the left side. And you need to track this one by looking, but this will not help you by doing actual measurement. You need to use the M mode. So this is the 2D picture. Now I'm in the right spot. I can see the two uh, border of the uh, diaphragm. Then you put your M mode in the middle of this one, and you have to have these two lines. And this will be the result, the M mode, that you will see the uh, parietal part will be fixed in here. And you start to see the diaphragm during expiration, the narrowing, and during inspiration, the widening. And this cycle will continue depend on the rate of breathing of your baby. And you have to have, as you can see in here, at least three cycles, because we can't do the measurement in one cycle only. Like don't get like one expiration, one inspiration and say, I got the measurement. Because as you know, the baby, uh, baby's breathing can vary from breath to breath. And you need to make sure that you have the average for the diaphragmatic thickness during expiration and inspiration. So what we do in academia, I measure like three expiration, pump them and divide them by three to get the expiration. Then I do the same, three in expiration, one, two, three, minimum. Some people do five breath, five expiration, five in expiration, pump them and divide them by the number, three or five, depend on number of cycles. And then you get the average uh, thickness during inspiration. Any questions so far? Don't feel shy. And as I mentioned, to, to, uh, Dr. Alec, um, I'm, I'm the person who does not like to give the whole presentation and wait for question, which is absolutely fine too. Uh, but if you have question with each part, we can explain it more. Uh, um, unless it's clear, then we, then we'll continue to move. So Mayank, do you want to unmute yourself and ask, please? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, um, uh, uh, I was uh, wondering if the thickness of the diaphragm would change in spontaneous, uh, in when, during ventilator breaths, if the baby is not, uh, does not have any breathing efforts. I think this is an excellent question. And I was coming to uh, mention this one, that when you, when you do the, um, uh, assessment of the diaphragm, uh, thickness, or even excursion, the baby has to be on continuous breathing. So can, you cannot do it while the baby is on assisted uh, ventilation because this will represent uh, the, the combination, what the baby is doing and what the ventilation is assisting with. It doesn't represent the independent function of the diaphragm by itself without assistance. Um, so if you will do assessment while the baby on um, uh, a mechanical ventilation, you need to pause the mechanical ventilation. You might keep the baby on some, some sort of like CBAP to overcome the resistance of the tube if the baby is intubated. And you do the assessment while the baby on non, kind of non-invasive or CBAP pressure, but not assisted ventilation. If you are worried that the baby is not functioning well, Definitely, you will not have 
exactly the same image as I'm showing you. And I'm going to share with you what if the baby is having a paralysis secondary to chest surgery or PDA ligation or any uh, surgery that can affect the phrenic nerve or the current uh, or the, yeah, the phrenic nerve. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That was very clear. Thank you. Does anybody Any else? Question? If no question, then we'll move. But remember, at any time, you can say, oh, now I remember question regarding the thickness. And we can go back and review this one one more time. I believe that this is new for most of us, including myself. Uh, we just started to do the diaphragm and use it more or less regularly in the unit, I would say, for the last two to three years. So it's not something even it came after learning the lung ultrasound. So I'm expecting that's new for most of us. Okay. Uh, again, the, the, and I kind of this, described this one in the previous slide, uh, which is you have to have the 2D. And once you are happy with your uh, area of opposition, you can see the two layers. You see the contraction, relaxation, contraction, the relaxation is the narrowing, contraction is the widening. You are happy with it. Then you press on the M mode on your um, machine. Bring the line in the middle of your diaphragm. Don't bring it close to the rib because it will appear as black and represent the liver and the rib. And try to be in the middle because you can't adjust. The baby will not listen to you. This is not adult. Baby can move. So try to be in the middle. So the baby move, your M mode is still within the area where you can assess the diaphragm. So then this is my, my tip uh, from my experience uh, when we do the uh, diaphragm assessment. So line the M mode in the middle, and this is how it will be reflected. You will see very nice narrowing and widening, narrowing, widening, expiration, and inspiration. And as I mentioned earlier, you measure from inside to inside. Sometimes it's very difficult, especially in our babies, uh, uh, because the line is very thin. So either inside, inside, or at least to be on the top of the, the line itself, uh, what I'm referring to this echogenic line and this echogenic line, because um, in our babies, it's not the same as adults. The thickness could be two millimeter or one and a half millimeter, which was tiny movement of your cursor. When you do the measurement, uh, you can change the whole equation and the, the measurement. Want to say something that I forgot to mention. As you can see here, uh, because I know and I'm very sure Dr. Alec already uh, discussed with you the, um, the depth, how deep your image should be. When it comes to the thickness, I need you to be as small depth as possible. You can see it is only two centimeters. And in some babies, the tiny ones, I use one centimeter depth, only one. So all my focus will be, because what I'm looking for is actually between these two lines, that's it. I don't want to see anything below. Yes, part of the liver will come even if you do one centimeter, but that's what you are looking for. Then it will give you a, a more clear and wide image um, that you can easily measure. The more the depth, it will be narrow and it will be difficult for you to measure, especially the expiration where it becomes very, very narrow and you can put your two dots. Make sense? So the focus will be against the diaphragm, so around 0.5 to 1. This will be the focus for your uh, uh, ultrasound machine. And the depth shouldn't exceed two centimeters. Even one, one and a half centimeter would be fine. Okay. Any question for how you adjust your, what probe to use, where to position the probe, what to look for. And remember, I'm talking about zone of opposition because you can see the diaphragm continuing here. This is still the diaphragm, the two layers. You can see it's still down here. If I move my probe more uh, down, I can see that the diaphragm continue in this area. 
you can't use it here. This is not the area of opposition. Area of opposition is the part of the diaphragm that's very close to the lung. If we don't have the shadow of the rib in here, because this black area is the shadow of this rib. If we don't have the shadow, you should see the lung coming just beside this area. And this is where you measure the diaphragm thickness and not in any area uh, be like be uh, on the left. Any question? Okay. Uh, so what about this diaphragmatic thickness fracture? You will hear about this one. Um, or some like to call it diaphragmatic shortening fraction. Actually, this is um, represent the efficiency of the diaphragm. So the diaphragm between inspiration, which is getting thicker, and expiration, which is getting thinner, so that that ha have at least 30% difference between the two. The more, the more efficient the diaphragm, the contraction of the diaphragm. Okay, so at least 30%. And we use this one in babies to predict if the baby will succeed extubation or not. If the diaphragm is doing less uh, fraction shortening, less than by 30%, you will be worried that this baby might not succeed the extubation. How we calculate the shortening fraction or thickness fraction? Here is the equation in blue. So you measure the thickness at the end of inspiration minus the thickness at the end of expiration. Then you divide all by the thickness at the end of expiration and you time this one with 100. And this should give you a percentage of short, shortening fraction. And we found that a shortening fraction get affected if the baby is on mechanical ventilation for a long time. And when we say long time, don't expect days. The for sure days will affect, but even hours can affect the shortening fraction. That's why we use this one to assess did the mechanical ventilation affected my diaphragm? Should I give the baby more room to breathe independent and less assisted by the ventilation before I try the extubation or not? Okay. There is a very famous term in adult called the ventilation induced diaphragmatic dysfunction. And this is what I was describing now. When the baby on mechanical ventilation and they mention up to like six to 16 hours on mechanical ventilation, expect that there will be some negative effect on the diaphragm. And the other important uh, indication for assessing diaphragmatic thickness fraction is when you are assessing the lung aeration. And we found there is a linear uh, relationship between the loss of lung aeration and the diaphragmatic thickness fraction. The more loss, the more harder the diaphragm will be working, as you would expect. Baby with uh, parenchymal lung disease means less aeration of the lung. This baby will have a higher diaphragmatic thickness fraction. And we did a study on this regard that I'm going to share with you uh, later uh, when we do the literature review, where I will show you that the thickness fraction become bigger if the lung the parenchyma is sick. Okay, any question? Because I'm almost done with the diaphragmatic thickness measurement, probe, position, how to measure it, where to measure it, what depth, what's the diaphragmatic shortening fraction or thickness fraction, what's the equation, how, how to measure it, and where to apply it. I see a few hands, please go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so I wanted to know is uh, if the zone of apposition change uh, with respiration. For example, uh, does it move up and down with respiration? Uh, uh, because sometimes, for example, uh, when we do IVC measurements, uh, so uh, respiration actually makes it difficult because the, uh, the same segment moves up and down during the respiration. So does it happen with the uh, zone of apposition as well? That's an excellent question. So I will reassure you, if you're broke in the right spot, you are lucky. 
it will not move unless the whole baby move below you. Like if the baby changes the position uh, up and down or side to side, and you have little bit slide of your probe from where the area that you were seeing the zone of opposition. Uh, otherwise, you'll be able to see it if you're probing the same spot, baby is not moving. No, you will be able to see it clear and it will not change position. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Hi, I wanted to know if for this um, diaphragm thickness fraction, does it remain same for preterm and term, or is there any difference? Uh, you are you slide ahead of me, Kirti. Uh, so do you mind to wait until I share with you this one? Yeah. Thank so you. this work is this work is actually done, and I will share with you the difference between the pragmatic thickness and thickness fraction in preterm versus term base. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? I'm not seeing all of you, so please either jump in or, uh, or if we have Dr. Alec, then uh, please indicate if there is any. Because I see Rama, your hand is up. Yeah, uh, just um, two questions. Um, if you've got the diaphragmatic thickness, uh, like in absolute terms, are there any normal values for depending on gestation and weight? I don't know if that is the case. And the yes. other thing, and the other thing you is- guys, You guys are ahead of the presentation, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, the short answer, Rana, is yes. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah. And the other, other thing question? is, um, the other thing is with the, with the formula, with the, uh, the, the pragmatic thickness fraction, because when, uh, if it is the same as the uh, fractional shortening of the systolic function of the left ventricle, is you divide it by, the bigger number, which is end, ex end inspiration, should be in that formula. Yeah. It, it came to my mind the first time I used this one, but this is the, um, uh, the definition and the formula that is used by everyone. Uh, okay. It's actually using the uh, denominator would be the uh, end of inspiration and not end of inspiration. But thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. Any other question? Again, uh, this is not one way presentation. <clears throat> if you remember anything, we can go back and review. <clears throat> so uh, this to answer uh, the, not the last question, the one before, um, <clears throat> if there is any difference regarding the, um, the thickness for term babies versus preterm babies. And the short answer, as you can see, so this work was done um, very early, almost 20 years ago. And uh, what they found, they started by 37, which is the definition of full term, all the way to 41 week. And as you can see, the dimension, which reflect the thickness of the diaphragm and thickness fraction, get a little bit smaller, but not significant difference. So once you, once you have the full term, it become more and more more or less the same um, for uh, full term base. And I have another uh, paper uh, published by one of the instructors for this course, uh, Dr. Alanzo, uh, who actually give us some reference number for uh, full term and preterm babies. But this is just to give you a glance that for full term babies, it's more or less the same. Comparing to the preterm babies, and this study did it from 24 weeks all the way to 38. And as you can see, the diaphragmatic thickness and thickness fraction become bigger and bigger, as you would expect. The, uh, the diaphragm muscle is like any other muscle of the body, is growing as the baby grows and actually has direct correlation with body weight. So if you bring two babies, 30 weeks, both of them, one is, let's say, 2.5 kilos and one is 1.5 kilos. Um, the, the bigger baby expected to have a bigger size of the diaphragm dimensions uh, and consequently will be thickness fraction. Compared to the small size babies, their diaphragm will be also small. But with progression in gestational age, expect that this is, will be constantly 
in a linear relationship, positive linear relationship with gestational age. And I can add with, with also birth weight. Okay, I hope this addresses the question for our colleague who asked about if there is difference between preterm and term babies when it comes to the um, the the frame dimensions, uh, thickness and thickness fraction. <clears throat> okay, we'll move to the second part of uh, ultrasound assessment of the diaphragm, which is the diaphragmatic excursion, which assess the the actual movement uh, of the dome of the diaphragm up and down during inspiration and expiration. Again, we'll do the same uh, systematic way. We'll look at what probe to use, where to position your probe. Also, we can talk about the depth of the uh, ultrasound. So to assess the um, excursion, you have to change your probe from the linear probe to be the uh, convex uh, or curvy linear probe. Okay, this is one. The second, you need to be more subcostal. And where exactly will be somewhere between the midclavicular line and the anterior axillary line. And your probe will not be looking similar to the lung ultrasound, like perpendicular with your marker looking at the head. You need to tilt it a little bit to the right side of the patient. So kind of looking up and posterior and to the right side. As you can see it in this position of the, the probe in here. Again, when we say this one, this is just a landmark for you. But if you put it in this way, and the baby is actually a little bit tilted to the left or, or leaning more to the right side, it might not give you the perfect image where you can do the uh, uh, assessment for the exposure. Then you need to adjust your probe in a way to get the right image. In regard to the depth, how deep should be um, uh, um, uh, when I do the uh, assessment of the portion in my babies in the unit is usually around six uh, centimeter depth. See the huge difference in portion with one, 1.5 maximum two in the thickness. When it comes to the portion because you go and use the, the lever as your acoustic window, then you need this uh, low frequency probe the curvy linear, you need to cross all the way through the, the lever and looking up to see the dome of the diaphragm and track the piston action of the uh, diaphragm. That's why you need this like at least six centimeter depth. If you see that the diaphragm is not clear for you, then you can increase the depth more to bring the diaphragm into a nice into the frame but not make it like too deep, then you can't get like a good resolution for the diaphragm itself. And this is one of the reasons why you are using the convex or the curvilinear, because this is a low frequency one, so it can travel to a deeper structure. What you will expect to see, your probe remember is here, at the top here. It's coming through the lever, looking at the diaphragm. When the baby inspirates, which means the diaphragm moves toward the abdomen, means the diaphragm moving toward your probe, it will give you this deflation, the positive one. Okay? And when the diaphragm starts to move back during exhalation, then it starts to fall down. And this is the inspiration arm, and this is the expiration arm of one breath. Okay, and I'm going to discuss in the subsequent images how we can measure the actual exposure in millimeter uh, and report this one if you need to report it as a number. But I will stop here if you have any question in the technique, the position of the probe, and the depth of your image. Uh, sorry, but just one question. Uh, can we use another probe than curvilinear or convex? Uh, for example, the probe of cardiac ultrasound if we don't have it? I, I would say you can try the, uh, the uh, uh, base array, um, but the ideal one would be the curvilinear 
I never tried the linear, if you are referring to linear key. Because it, it, the resolution will not be good. If you use the linear, definitely the phase array can help. And the ideal one, as I mentioned, is the curvy link. Adele, I have a question. So just mm -hmm. in terms of the frequency that you use, uh, I mean, any particular frequency that is better in terms of a minimum that you would have? Yeah, for, for this one, what we have is five, uh, to, five to eight will be uh, a good, uh, a good like low frequency bro. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Naz, you have a question? Um, I think you answer, asked my question, Alok. Um, but can I also ask Adele, um, so the probe essentially you're putting it um, vertical and then you're tilting it towards the right side. So the marker on the probe is actually facing the right side towards the axillary not, side. Not not facing the right completely, as you can see, it like tilted toward the right side. Okay. So it's not so, it's not it's not a transverse one. Okay. And Nes, just I and I need to stress this one. I like when we. We'll discuss this one that you have this flexibility uh, when you use the pro and you are not i need to remember exactly what added said he needed kind of looking at i will say 11 uh, 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock around this one no be flexible start with this one the whole idea that i need you to focus on not your hand remember when you do driving you don't look at the your steering wheel you hold the steering wheel, but you look uh, uh, up front to see your road. Similar, when you do the scan for any of the above, you put the probe in the expected area that will give you the best image, but your eyes should be on the monitor of the ultrasound. And start to play with the position and orientation of the probe to get the image that will help you to do the proper assessment. I show you the... Um, how the area of opposition should look like, and you need to remember it has to be this way, no other way. You can measure it unless you get it this way. When we come here to the extortion, you need to bring the diaphragm as much as you can below the level. Most of the time, it will be kind of coming tilting, and I hope you are looking at my hand. So the level is here. And the diaphragm ideally should be this way if you can see my hand this is a diaphragm and your so your m mode would be perpendicular on the diaphragm this is ideal in most of the cases this is, would be difficult and it would be tilted this way and the lever is here then you bring your m mode kind of perpendicular up to 20 degree difference from the 90 degree still acceptable because I don't want you to get the diaphragm this way. See, like almost barrel. And you put the, your M mode tangential, like 30 degree. And you say, I got the diaphragmatic extortion. No, this misleading. And the number you will get will not reflect the actual extortion for the baby. Has to be as much as you can below the liver. Your M mode has to be perpendicular and not tangential to the diaphragm. Uh, to get the right measurement, which is more or less similar to what you are seeing here. So you have to start from what we recommend, uh, which is between the mid-clavicular anterior axillary subcostal. Start by looking up and to the right. But if you feel that this is not the image that you are getting, please start to rotate your probe little bit to the right or to the left to get the image in the right orientation. So what you will get as uh, excursion will be actually reflecting the, the baby's excursion and not because of operator orientation. Does this make sense for you guys? Yes, thank you. Dor Doris, you have yeah. a question? Uh, I was just going to ask about the frequency again. Is it the same frequency we use for 10 and pre 10 babies? You said between five to eight. So is it the same yeah. or we change it? 
No, I use the same, exactly the same for okay. uh, preterm and term babies. I have one machine, I'm expecting a second one, and this is not to talk about the echo one. We have another two for echo, and I'm getting a second one for uh, our unit for this one. But when I did a study that I'm going to share with you for preterm and term babies to compare their um, uh, diaphragmatic function, uh, I used exactly the same probe for both of them and worked fine. Okay. You might need to Thank play uh, Dorsey, yeah. You might need to play with the depth a little bit, increase the depth more when you are dealing with uh, full term babies or big size babies in general. Compared to the small one, you might not need all this depth. Okay. So, Sujit? Yeah, Adele, can you just uh, talk us through the M or the peaks? Uh, do they represent inspiration? The, the, yeah. So let me see what the next slide might give you. Yeah, here. So this is a, a, a baby from the unit. And as you can see, like lots of B lines because this lung is a premature lung. This is the, the probe is somewhere in here. And this is the lever. I'm going through the lever. My M mode more or less perpendicular on the diaphragm. Run it one more time. As you can see, the diaphragm is contracting and it's giving me this um, uh, exposure. How do we do the measurement? So we go from the, the maximum peak of this uh, positive deflation of the, uh, the wave, and you draw a perpendicular line to the baseline that touch the base for at least two to three. And before I forget, exactly the same as we did with the thickness, extortion, you measure at least three or more, and you get the average because baby can fluctuate from breath to breath, and you need to make sure that you get the average extortion for this baby. So to do the, uh, and there is multiple, sorry, and there is multiple ways as I'm going to discuss, but the classic way of measuring the extortion is to go to the peak of this wave, which end of inspiration, and draw a perpendicular line to the base, and this will be the excursion for this wave. If your question, uh, uh, so it, uh, where you define the inspiration and, and, and expiration, same. From the baseline, this is the beginning of the baby taking inspiration, goes all the way to the peak. This is the end of inspiration. And when the baby starts to exhale, you will see the down slope of this wave until it reach to the base where a second cycle of inspiration, expiration starts. Perfect, thank you. And I'm going to explain different ways of assessing the contractility of the diaphragm. But the classic one that I need you to digest it very well, most of the time reported this way is a diaphragmatic distortion. And the way of measurement is the way I'm showing you in here. Any question with this one? How to position, what probe? Where to position the probe? The depth, what you are looking for, and how you measure the, the, uh, the excursion in millimeters. Okay. There is another way of um, assessing the diaphragmatic uh, contractility or movement. So one of them, and this is all reported actually in literature, is called inspiratory velocity, which means what the, sp the speed of the diaphragm if the diaphragm is like dumb, like my hand now, how, um, how much time the diaphragm need to move from this shape to the, the abdomen, down, in inspiration. So this is, will be the distance divided by the second. So the speed of the diaphragm to reach to its peak from this white dot to this white dot, if you measure this slope this way, not the perpendicular line. Remember the previous one? You measure from the uh, peak to the baseline. This is what the definition of the pragmatic excursion. But the pragmatic or inspiratory velocity, you measure this distance divided by second, 
And most of the machine can do this one, especially if you are using the echo machine. It can actually measure for you and give you a number. Uh, is it like one, milli one uh, millimeter per second or how long it takes? So this is the inspiratory velocity in case you become interested more to read more about the pragmatic function. So if you see the expression in inspiratory velocity, this is what it means. What is the speed of the diaphragm going from end of expiration to the peak or end of inspiration? The second one, what's the inspiratory time? Like, it takes how long from the beginning of inspiration to the end of inspiration? And this will be the distance between the two red lines, beginning of um, inspiration to the end of inspiration. And this will give you the inspiratory time. And similarly, the expiratory time will be the distance between beginning of expiration to the end of expiration between the red and yellow line. This is more for academia. Uh, I didn't use it myself or see it used in, uh, in literature except the inspiratory velocity. Some people now start to report the inspiratory velocity instead of the um, uh, diaphragmatic exposure or both together. They will report the diaphragmatic uh, uh, excursion and the inspiratory velocity. Any question for this terminology and what it means and how to measure it? Sorry, is this not related to the respiratory effort and the respiratory rate of the baby? The uh, inspiratory velocity? So, Yes and no. Yes, because each cycle, each inspiration, expiration, represent a breath complete in and out. And this is will be how many breaths. And if you have this one, like for example, if we say that this is one second, I will say that one, two, three, four, five, this baby is breathing five breaths per second, for example. But what we are referring to by inspiratory velocity, it's inspiratory time, expiratory time has nothing to do with the, with the rate itself. This is in each within a cycle of in and out, what will be the velocity? What will be the inspiratory time? What will be the expiratory time? Within one cycle, for example. And you can do multiple cycles and average them too. I hope I didn't take you a little bit far because I still, my interest, if you come out of this presentation with two things, how to perform the pragmatic thickness and measure thickness in inspiration, expiration, then do the shortening fraction or thickness fraction. This is one piece. And second piece, how you can assess the pragmatic exposition, uh, which the previous slide, this one, how to measure the exposition. This two, is actually you can use them in your practice, not for academia, not for only research. We are using this one for research too, but you can use this one, the thickness and thickness fraction and the exposition to assess the baby uh, before extubation, for example, which is my interest to pass to you today is the clinical piece, because I believe all of us, uh, first job is clinician and how we are, can learn something to help you make an informed decision at the bedside. This is the aim, the primary aim of the presentation. But I give a little bit extra in case you will be more interested and you start to read stuff, then you know what, what each terminology of this one means. Any questions? And one small again, I'm not seeing all of you. Mohammed, you need to yes, you just uh, so did this measurement of diaphragm, all these indices, uh, help in, for example, scoring the severity of respiratory distress or pneumonia or or any any lung disease? Um, the short answer is not. No one make this correlation except if you are talking that pneumonia affected the lung irrigation, which it will does it will do. 
then definitely you are expecting that the pragmatic thickness fraction will increase because this vapor will be working hard to breathe and which mean more contraction and you'll have a bigger uh, inspiratory um, thickness and compared to the baseline the expiratory one and this will lead to a higher um, uh, the pragmatic thickness fraction but it will not do the other way around you have your direct tool muhammad as you learned from the previous presentation that you can look at the lung parenchyma using the lung ultrasound you can assess the presence or absence of pathology like pneumonia and you can even do the measurement for the pneumonia and see how big or how small and you can start your management and follow up your baby so i will not use the diaphragm to help help me assess what's going on with the parenchyma. I'll go and ask the parenchyma direct. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Any other question? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing all of you again. Uh, so feel free, please, to jump in and mute yourself and talk. Okay. What about diaphragmatic paralysis? And this is not uncommon question, I will say. I have been asked this question a couple of times. Uh, we are tertiary unit. We receive lots of uh, complicated cases that comes to the unit. And some of them, will, babies will have uh, congenital uh, anomalies. And the baby's full term baby still um, uh, dependent on the respiratory support. And the question always comes, does this baby have a good diaphragm? So you can ask this, what we already discussed before. And you can have some reference from the paper that I'm going to share with you to see if this baby has a reasonable um, uh, function for the diaphragm or not. But also, uh, if your hospital or your unit receive babies post surgery, especially thoracic uh, surgery for any reason, there is the risk that the baby might have uh, diaphragmatic paralysis. And you would be surprised that it's very, very simple. If you learn how to do the expulsion, definitely you'll be able to say if the baby has a diaphragmatic paralysis or not. So we discussed this, this side before. So you bring the liver, your probe is actually here. This is the liver and this is the diaphragm. And if you are using the M mode, then this is the norm because when the baby starts to breathe in, which means inspiration, the diaphragm will move toward the, the probe. And then you will have positive deflation above the baseline. And this is what happened here, and we discussed it a few times. And when it starts to go back in expiration, you start to, to see it going toward the baseline. And this is repeat all the way. This will not happen if the diaphragm, like for example, in this baby, is actually paralyzed. The baby will have what we call paradoxical movement the reverse. So during inspiration, because of the negative pressure in the chest, the diaphragm will go up, so away from your probe. So it will be drawn for you as a negative below the baseline. So you see like flat, flat, with one inspiration, it goes down. So if you have this one reverse it, one, uh, this will be your hint that there is diaphragmatic paralysis in this state. I forgot to mention that, and you see most of the example that I shared with you, I'm using the level. Because always the assessment of the right side is much easier than assessment of the left side, given the small size of the, uh, the spleen. Little bit challenge, but not, um, not impossible. You can definitely do the assessment of the left side, but the easier side, always the, the right side because of the, the lever. Give you a big acoustic window where you can see the, the diaphragm. Any question how the diaphragm, paralyzed diaphragm will look like? Yeah, I have a confusion. So uh, yes. most of the times these babies would be intubated. So uh, uh, post-surgery or uh, if there's uh, significant distress, they would be intubated and under mechanical ventilation. So there would be movement of the diaphragm anyways due to positive pressure ventilation. So how do you differentiate? So, um, Manak, this is an excellent question. 
again, even if this beam is ventilated, uh, you have to pause the, the, so you can adjust everything. You bring your machine, you put the bra completely uh, hearing you. So this is my probe. My baby's on mechanical ventilation assisted one. What I do practically is I bring my machine, everything is ready. I, I put the probe on the, uh, the proper uh, position. I can see the diaphragm, I see the lever, I see everything. Then I ask either the RT or the bedside nurse or yourself, you pause the, uh, the machine for 10 seconds, five seconds, according to the tolerance of your baby. But you need to put the baby on uh, no support except some kind of sleeper to maintain the FRC. And then you assess the spontaneous movement of this diaphragm. You can't assess the diaphragm while the baby is on mechanical ventilation. No way. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. And, and most of these babies will tolerate because you pause for only this few seconds. And if you need to repeat, you give the baby a couple of breaths. Then you pause again and you repeat your scan one more time. Any other question? Okay. I think this is the two parts that I need to discuss with you. Now I'm going to uh, some um, uh, literature review. Again, to share with you some evidence of uh, the utilizing of the bedside ultrasound to assess the diaphragm um, and end up with some conclusion. But feel free if we need to go back and review some of the technique um, of assessing the diaphragm. And I'd like to start with this one. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Dr. Alanzu is one of the instructors. I'm not sure if she uh, gave you a presentation or not, but if she didn't, she will uh, present for you. She's one of the excellent um, physicians in the field of point of care, especially lung and diaphragm ultrasound. And she put this uh, title for a tutorial uh, in the chest, um, I believe in 2022. And this was a comment on a paper that we, our group from Toronto published. And she uh, used this title that I like to start with this one. Can diaphragmatic ultrasound become a new application for point of care ultrasound in preterm infants? And in her comment, it's only one page, and I believe it's open access. You can, um, you can go like, Google it and you will get it. Um, it's kind of yes. The short answer was yes, but it was nice commentary on our paper. And this is the paper that we did in our unit um, and published in the chest, the pragmatic thickness and excursion in preterm infants with BBT compared to term and near term baby. I used the healthy uh, pre, uh, late preterm babies and term babies as my control uh, because this was the first ever study that looked at babies with BBD and how their function from the diaphragm thickness and excursion. And just not to go through all the details, let me share with you these two parts. As you can see, the pragmatic thickness fraction is almost 60% uh, compared to around 40% for the healthy group. 40 is around what you would expect. Remember, we mentioned 30 is the minimum. Um, below 30, you know that there is a dysfunction of the diaphragm. But our babies with BBD and chronic lung changes, and this is the baby who were still on oxygen or respiratory support at 36 weeks, because this is how we define BBD. Definitely, there were, their babies were working harder to breathe. That's why they have a bigger diaphragmatic thickness fraction. And similarly, when we assess the diaphragmatic excursion in millimeters, it was higher, which represents the contractility of the diaphragm up and down. So it was around six. This is the mean uh, standard deviation compared to 4.4 in healthy babies, which kind of expected, but it was never studied before. And this was the first uh, time to show uh, how we can assess uh, the diaphragmatic a thickness and excursion in preterm babies with BBD, not healthy preterm babies. 
Again, Dr. Alonzo, I can see here, um, was asked in this presentation. And this was one of the, our colleague in the group asked if there is reference number for breather babies and term babies and how it looks like. And is it correlated to the gestational age and size of the baby or not? And Dr. Alonzo and her group, again, give us the reference value for the, the pragmatic shortening fraction in term babies and in preterm babies. And as you can see, in all measures, uh, left side and, and right side of the diaphragm, in both, it will be bigger and higher in the term babies compared to the preterm babies. Okay. Um, I brought this one just to share with you that this was a, a paper published looking for what could be the application for um, ultrasound to assess the diaphragmatic function. Again, we discussed it can be post-surgery to assess the diaphragm, but the most common used one in our population, especially all of us and neonates, will be to assess the diaphragm for babies who are on mechanical ventilation. To assess, can you wean the pressure? and also uh, can you extubate the baby? So this is the most common one. Again, if a baby with neuromuscular disease, it would be nice to know if the diaphragmatic function is preserved or is very low. You can see the expulsion is very low uh, if you compare it with the reference numbers. Uh, similarly, if there is skeletal disease, there is receiving medication, muscle relaxant, any, any of this indication. What's the definition for um, long-term mechanical ventilation does not mean weeks or months. This paper is talking about six hours per day for three weeks. And, and there is another paper in adult. For adult population, they consider 16 hours. Mechanical ventilation is enough to cause some diaphragmatic dysfunction for someone who is in mechanical ventilation. It's scary uh, how it looks like. I'm hoping at some point that we will do similar in units because there is no one in units that follows the babies day by day to see how the diaphragmatic thickness and thickness fraction evolve over time as the baby grows, especially for babies who stayed on mechanical ventilation for some time. Um, again, what's the effect of mechanical ventilation um, on the diaphragmatic muscle? It goes thinning, make the muscle, because you can remember this one, if you have ever been in a, in a cast because of bone fracture, any muscle that does not get used fully become atrophied and become thinner. And this was happen. you can see from day one ventilation, this is where the diaphragmatic thickness was. And as this patient was on mechanical ventilation for up to eight days, you see the thickness become less and less and less. And this is adult population, by the way. Similar work was done in children, exactly the same work. And they went to seven days of ventilation and they measured the thickness from day one to day seven. And again, they showed that there is progressive decrease in the diaphragmatic thickness um, that correlate with the duration of mechanical ventilation. Scary, right? But it explained part of this one, explained also why some babies fail to come off despite they were on minimal respiratory support, right? We don't exhibit babies who are on very high pressure. Exhibit babies on or reasonable pressure, almost room air or 25%, everything looks fine. And despite this one, some of them, when you take the tube out, baby will fail and need the tube back. And you wonder, what's going on? The lung looks fine. The setting was not high. Why the baby is failing? You need to think of the diaphragm is as another layer or another reason that could um, put this way, baby in failure. And you need to prepare the baby by decreasing the support and allow more diaphragm function before you take the tube out. There was a question from, I believe, uh, Dr. Muhammad, one of the group asking pneumonia 
and or parenchyma, I would call it parenchyma lung disease and diaphragm function. And again, you will see that there is correlation between lung irrigation or lung pathology and the diaphragmatic function. It will become, and here they divided the population into two groups, if the score less than 14, and if the score is more than 14, significant lung pathology. And as you can see, there is significant difference between the two groups, mean the group with thicker lung will be working harder, and their diaphragm will be giving more thickness and thickness fraction. You might ask here and say, okay, now I'm confused. You say, if um, the baby needed support, the diaphragm will be thinner. This is if you are using a assisted ventilation. But if you are on non-invasive ventilation and the baby has his own control uh, and there is lung pathology, you actually overworking the diaphragm. And as any muscle, when you use the muscle a lot, it becomes thicker and the uh, thickening uh, fraction will be higher uh, in, in, uh, in this space. Um, another paper uh, study that was conducted uh, in Egypt and looking for the assessing the diaphragmatic thickness and expulsion as a predictor for successful excavation in mechanical ventilation. This group used um, uh, or enrolled the babies who are born at less than 32 weeks who were on mechanical ventilation and uh, they did the ultrasound one hour before a blank extubation, and they defined a successful extubation as a baby stayed off invasive mechanical ventilation for at least uh, three days. And they measured the diaphragmatic thickness and uh, the thickness fraction uh, and compared this measure. Adele, we can't hear you. Sorry. You can't hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Hello. No, that's all right. Uh, is it from the same slide here or? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Should I start from the beginning or you guys heard what the study was about? You can start again, no problems. Sure. So I, I was saying that this study was done in units, uh, looking for uh, or utilizing the diaphragmatic assessment, thickness and expulsion to define which babies will be more successful when you try extubation. Inclusion criteria was um, babies born less than 32 weeks on invasive mechanical ventilation. And the ultrasound was done only an hour before the extubation and they define successful extubation as baby stayed off mechanical ventilation for at least 72 hours. And they did the thickness, thickness fraction and excursion, and they compared it between the two groups. As, as you know, you do the scan, you go ahead with the extubation, you stay for three days, then you see which group failed, which group success, then you go back to the ultrasound and see what the criteria for the ultrasound for the failed group versus the successful group. And they found that diaphragmatic excursion, a good diaphragmatic excursion, was good indicator for successful excavation. Uh, we did similar work, but we used actually very, very, very small babies. Because in our unit, uh, babies who are 26 weeks and above, most of them will not be intubated. Uh, they are fine on non-invasive ventilation. So I had to repeat more or less the same study, uh, but on the extreme preterm days. You see the mean gestational age for the successful group was 25 weeks. And the mean gestational age for the failure group was only 24 weeks at the time of the scan. 
And um, we did not only the assessment of the diaphragm, uh, so we did the, the diaphragmatic uh, thickening and thickness fraction, and we did the expulsion, as you can see, and we did the measurements from the babies, but we added also how the lung looks like. So we did the lung ultrasound score, which is a little bit different from the score that's commonly used in most of the literature. So we did like five better from zero to four, but we can talk about this one in different uh, setting. And what we found in, in our uh, paper that, uh, because these babies have a very, very thick lung, the big difference was actually in the lung ultrasound score. And we couldn't appreciate a big difference when it comes to the diaphragmatic exposure. Both of them, success and failure group, was working hard to the point that their exposure were more or less the same, 3.4 versus 3.5 millimeter. Is it the sample size? Because this was only 36 against nine babies. Is it our measurement? Remember what I was saying to you, make the depth very small, so you have a good uh, view and you can do proper measurement, could be any of the above. Definitely the study need to be repeated on a larger sample size. But again, another tool that we used it to assess the readiness for uh, extubation in extreme preterm babies. Um, this interesting paper um, that I actually not published yet. This paper is not published. Um, it was sent to me for review and uh, it got accepted. So that's why I have the permission to share because accepted coming hopefully soon uh, in the frontier. Uh, so this group did something very interesting. They were looking for the relationship between the uh, PDA, especially the hemodynamic PDA, and the inspiratory velocity. Do you remember the diaphragmatic inspiratory velocity? Anyone remember what this one was about? I'm testing you. Uh, yes. Uh, if you yes, want, this is the time, uh, the time to reach maximum inspiratory uh, peak of the diaphragmatic contraction. Excellent. As it shows here, the T. Um, I or T1 is how long it takes from the diaphragm from the beginning of contraction or inspiration to the maximum in here. This is the regular expulsion, the D. Okay. And they found very interesting finding that the in babies with hemodynamic significant PDA, and there was association with lower. Uh, like lower diaphragmatic velocity. And the possible, they concluded that this is, uh, there is possible association uh, between the hemodynamic significant PDA and the negative effect on the diaphragmatic function. Again, I was having some concern in my report, but this is only all in all 17 babies or 18 babies. And it was the retrospective study. Is not a, a prospective and very small sample size, but it gives us another perspective. Should we study the diaphragmatic function in babies with hemodynamic significant PDA? You know, the heart and lung are kind of one organ. They talk to each other a lot. And we need to uh, think of all the factors that can affect the diaphragmatic function, especially for babies, as I mentioned, who are on invasive mechanical ventilation. Like to share this one with you. Uh, last but not least, uh, again, um, uh, this study was done to diagnose if there is abnormal diaphragmatic motion in infant after um, heart surgery. Again, they are looking for diaphragmatic paralysis. We discussed this one before. Again, in normal, you will see that the inspiration is in the positive side, so above the baseline. But if there is diaphragmatic paralysis, this is your baseline here. You see the inspiration are all paradoxical movements it's coming down in the negative side of your baseline. Okay, I think this could be my the one before my last. 
So in conclusion, then we'll open the floor for more questions. If you have more questions, that Refram ultrasound is a new point of care ultrasound application that we start to use it more and more in the ICU. And the Ephraim ultrasound could help in assessing extubation redness and weaning from non-invasive ventilation and invasive for sure. And the phragmatic dysfunction um, is a major contribution to the prolongation of mechanical ventilation. So we should consider it and try to extubate the babies as soon as they are ready even if you use non-invasive, higher pressure or non-invasive ventilation. And the frame ultrasound is one tool. The last one is one of your tools and not the only tool. So as we discussed before, you have to do the long ultrasound first to assess how the parenchyma looks like. You have to look at how much pressure you are using, how much oxygen that the baby is using, and how the diaphragm function, and you put all together to make your clinical decision. So don't take one of this one, like lung ultrasound, then you treat the baby based on the lung ultrasound alone, or the frame ultrasound, and you use the frame ultrasound to make the decision without looking for the other part of the patient clinical status. So always consider uh, any test, blood gas, the setting, the um, CO2, the diaphragm assessment, the lung parenchymal assessment, you put all together to make your informed decision regarding your baby. And I think with this one, I reach to the conclusion. Thank you so much for your attention and happy to uh, take the uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Can I ask, uh, ask a question, please? Sure, yeah. Yeah. So the um, maybe you maybe you maybe you you did explain this. So if the baby in assistant ventilation, how are you gonna see the wave when you put the M, M mode? Uh, uh, how are you gonna see the M mode if the baby in assistant ventilation? Maybe you explained. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think this is a very important question because it, it came a few times, um, and just remember, we don't assess the diaphragmatic excursion while the baby is fully supported with assisted ventilation, you need to pause the, um, or stop the assisted ventilation, put the baby on some kind of uh, CBAP, what we call same when you do the SPT, spontaneous breathing test. Um, you don't use it, you do a spontaneous breathing test while the baby is on full assisted uh, support. So you need to pause this one to the time, for the time of the scan. But have you ever you, put them in mode while the baby in assistant ventilation? Have you seen the wave? I mean, out of interest. It will it will not reflect the baby's okay. uh, own uh, movement, but uh, uh, no, the short answer is no. Okay. Um, can I ask another question? Yeah, please. Um, you, you know, during paralysis, how do you know this wave is, uh, because the baby uh, breathes very fast, how do you know this wave is actually, um, you know, opposite? To the normal, or is it, is it just a damped wave? So you look at the full trace. If this is one, but all the others on the other direction, you question okay. your technique. But if all consistently in this side is coming to the reverse, and you do the other side, hopefully this is not a complete paralysis on both sides. Okay. So okay. this is differential. You have the right side paralysis, left side is not. Then in the same patient, you can do both, and you'll see the difference between the two. We knew from uh, from even before with the fluoroscopy and other types of assessing of the diaphragm that with diaphragm paralysis you will have what we call the paradoxical movement, the reverse mm -hmm. of the the node. Okay, thank you. It's my pleasure. Anna, you have a question. Uh, yes, maybe I didn't listen, but uh, I don't know if uh, you referred the. Um, normal values of the diaphragmatic excursion in term and preterm babies? Yeah, uh, there is one paper um, uh, published in this regard. I didn't share it here. What I shared was uh, the thickness. Uh, what Dr. Alanzo uh, published was regarding the thickness on the right and left side and term and preterm babies, which I can share both with Dr. Aloko, uh, who can share it with the group. 
I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other I questions? I have a quick query. Yeah, I have a quick query. Question. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Ah, okay. So uh, I was just wondering if we can use qualitative uh, assessment uh, for diaphragmatic palsy. Uh, and we can we uh, actually put the probe uh, in the sub region and uh, uh, basically can visualize both the domes of diaphragm together. Um, would that uh, be possible or has it been tried? I believe it was tried. I read this one one time. Uh, depend on the, the footprint of your probe. Um, so and also to make sure that the not most of your image is actually visualizing the heart because with this position the heart comes right in front of you but if you are able to put the probe in a in a in the subcostal uh, either below the exploit or a little bit toward the right side directing the probe a little bit to the left side to capture both um, is an idea not sure about the reliability of this one because all the studies that looked at uh, reproducibility and the reliability of the test did it independent. You assess the right side and you choose the right spot and you do the left side independent and not to combine both. But have have we done both in the same time? Yes. I read it one time but can't remember which. Okay, thank you. I have a question, Adele. So one of the challenges that we sometimes face is you, you occasionally get babies with right-sided diaphragmatic hernias where the diaphragm is high and or you have babies who might have even tration uh, with the liver. I mean, have, have we looked at whether we can differentiate these two conditions using ultrasound in particular by trying to demonstrate diaphragmatic movements? So I, I will divide your question into two. Uh, yeah. I look just to make sure I understand it well and start with the eventration. So eventration is kind of weakness of the diaphragm. So it's not zero uh, expulsion. Um, so you will see some tiny movement, but not optimal to call it as a normal expulsion. And this is how, and you need the reference number to say that, no, this is way below the reference. I'm worried about the function of this part of the diaphragm. But in eventration, you have intact diaphragm. Yep. You have a diaphragm to assess. But if you are referring by diaphragmatic hernia, you don't have diaphragm to assess. Yep. You have a replaced as a whole. And our experience with this one, what you would be seeing is the kind of the more toward lung ultrasound, because you will see the bowels um, underneath your probe and not, not the diaphragm itself, because there is no diaphragm. It's a, it's a big hole yep. in this area. That's really helpful. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, look, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, uh, Go for it. Yeah, uh, Adele, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I had a couple of questions. One is, so say if you are... Um, uh, um, um, uh, looking for diaphragmatic paralysis. So in your practice, I take it you you measure the excursion on both the sides? We, we do uh, mainly the right side if I'm assessing the only the function in a otherwise normal. I'm not expecting paralysis or eventration. So we use the right side because most of the reference is actually coming from the right side and okay. less uh, reliability on the left side. So even if there is some reference, they acknowledge that the left side is difficult uh, to, to be sure 100% and give reference now. Uh, if you suspect uh, paralysis, uh, definitely you do both sides and you don't have to do any measurement. Once okay. you are seeing the paradoxical movement, the reverse of the normal, this will be your diagnosis. You don't have to, uh, uh, to measure the, uh, the, how this one relates to the normal. Like, what, is this excursion is like 10%, 50%, yeah. 70%. But if you are looking for, for example, um, you are using muscle relaxants and you need to assess the diaphragm, then I would suggest that definitely you will not see uh, paradoxical. Either you will see flat line 
if the medication is like hitting the diaphragm like 100% and knocking off the diaphragm, uh, or there will be some contraction, but very weak one. Okay. Like it will be small. Um, yeah, it will be like small. Uh, uh, I received a call, that's why, sorry. Call this yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there will be a tiny excursion, uh, which is way below the, uh, uh, way below the tunnel. Okay, uh, Tano, thank you so much. And I have another quick question. With regards to the diaphragmatic excursion, I know you've sort of shown uh, that it needs to be perpendicular to the, the diaphragm. Is there any objective measure? So how were you standardizing this in, in the research setting? I mean, you know, for example, like for blood flow velocities and echo, you have angle of insonation. Similarly, is there something that we can use so that you have Similar. standard? Similar. We have around 20. 20% uh, deviation from the perpendicular is still acceptable. Okay, 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 thank yeah. you. Uh, I agree with you. Sometimes it's very challenging giving the position of the baby and you try to adjust the probe as much as you can. Again, you can't get it the way, remember when you're saying this is the diaphragm level on top, your line come in the middle perpendicular is not that easy to get it this way. So even if you have a little bit tilt, you try to bring your M mode again as much as you can perpendicular. 20% 20, 20 deviation from the perpendicular is still acceptable. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Any other it questions? Needs lots, yeah. needs lots of practice. The diaphragm, the, uh, the learning curve for the diaphragm is much, much slower than the lung. I'm sorry to say this one. So use this opportunity whenever you do um, lung ultrasound, especially for the thickness and thickness fraction. Um, when you do the R3 or L3, you will be very close to where the position should be. And when you go down to the liver, just look by your eyes to the area of opposition, which end of the lung, beginning of the liver, and above the liver, you will see this two echogenic line. Try to be familiar by looking at this one. I pull the shortening and narrowing and widening. This is one. And try to put the M mode on this one. It's not easy. And to keep it for five seconds, even five seconds, the baby will not allow you. I got the two line. You just bring the M mode on, and the baby will move a little bit. Lost. You need to repeat again. One of the challenging one, and unless you practice this one, I will say at least one twice per week, it, it will be very difficult for you to um, to get the experience with measuring the the thickness and not to uh, give you a negative uh, wave. But this is actually was the most difficult part in our studies. I remember one of the studies that I shared with you is assessing the readiness for extubation. And um, um, we, we did the lung ultrasound score and assessing of the different bone. Doing the lung ultrasound was like a, a, a joy, like one, one and a half minute done for the lung. And we take almost five uh, to 10 minutes just to get the better view for the thickness and thickness fraction for the diaphragm. Excursion is not different. Excursion is a little bit easier than the thickness. Uh, any any final questions? Any last questions from the group? So I'm going to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank Adele for his time. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. And there's food for thought for us, but there's also a more practice because uh, I think most of our group is uh, getting good at being able to do the structured lung ultrasound uh, using R1, R2, uh, up to R6, but this is more kind of challenge for us as a group to go and practice. And we've got peer review sessions coming up uh, this weekend. That's Friday and Sunday. So I would say, folks, uh, while you're at it, let's watch Adele's uh, presentation again. I will circulate it within 24 hours uh, on the portal so that we can revise, we can have a look at it, and we can actually learn and try and practice. Uh, Adele, thank you so much for an absolutely fantastic talk. God bless you. And, uh, and I'm happy at any time. I look if there is any question or one-to-one uh, -one, uh, from the group, any question, you can 
pass my email or and I'm happy to uh, address any concerns. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I wish you a thank good you so evening. Much. And uh, thank you all for your patience and your hard work so far. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.